Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's Living Life. Now, today's passage has the story of Jesus healing uh, the demon-possessed boy. And, um, you know, this is actually found elsewhere in uh, the Synoptic Gospels as well. And I actually preached on the Mark's version, which is kind of the more full or detailed version. And it's, today's passage is actually quite shorter. The retelling is actually much shorter than Mark's passage. Now, interestingly, though, in Mark's passage there, I focused on, I mean, the focus was the discipleships um, of, G, of the disciples, uh, how to grow as a disciple and the true marks of a disciple. And today's passage is also discipleship, but in a much different way. Um, and we have to take the passages before and after to really get the context of not just the story, but the entire context of discipleship. So let's read the passage and then we'll continue. Luke chapter 9, verses 37 through 50. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully to what I am about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it and they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. As I said, Mark's retelling of the story of Jesus healing the demon-possessed boy is much longer. And from within the story, there is a lot that we can learn and draw out from. In Luke's retelling, however, you have to also take the greater context of the passage before and after to really understand what Jesus is talking about um, and teaching about in terms of discipleship. You know, and we started this yesterday and we continue today and then even into tomorrow. Now, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he is dropping big hints of his true identity uh, and what it means to be the Messiah, what the Messiah will truly look like, and also his mission at Jerusalem, which will be his death on the cross. And we see the big hints throughout the chapter, chapter 9, verse 22 says, I'll be reading in the NLT, the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things. He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. And then in verse 31, after the... The, transform, the transfiguration of Jesus, which was glorious to see. And then they, um, the Jesus and then Moses and Elijah, were talking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. It's very interesting that they use the word exodus. Jesus was going to exodus from the world, you know, after he dies and he ascends to heaven. And then in today's passage, verse 44, listen to me and remember what I say, Jesus said, the son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. Now, even just from these three verses, they're pretty, I mean, I guess for us, it's very, very clear, you know, with hindsight, and we know the entire story, you know, we'll give the disciples some slack, right? It's kind of early days for them, but, you know, still, they're huge hints that not everything is going to be as they expect and, and as they want. 
Verse 45 continues and it says, but they did not know what he meant. The disciples didn't know what he meant. Now let's zoom out and read verses 43 to 45. Verse 43, and then I'm reading the NLT. All gripped the people as they saw this majestic display of God's power. While everyone was marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Listen to me and remember what I say. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. But they didn't know what he meant. Its significance was hidden from them, so they couldn't understand it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. So after Jesus heals the boy, you know, everyone, including the disciples, were caught up in the moment of this amazing feat. I mean, the disciples actually tried to heal the boy. They couldn't do it. And Jesus comes along and just simply heals him. And everyone is like getting worked up like, whoa, 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 whoa. Which is why in the same verse, right, it's the same sentence actually. In the same sentence, Jesus cuts in and says, listen, right? There's that word again. We talked about this yesterday. Listen and remember, I am going to be betrayed, right? You're getting caught up with this thing, you know, the miracle and the amazing sign, the wonder. But remember, wait, wait. I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of my enemies, right? But, verse 45 says, they didn't know what he meant. Its significance was hidden from them. They didn't understand. And they were afraid to ask him. So they just kind of left it there, wondering and not knowing, which is why a silly argument broke out a while later about a very worldly thing. The disciples, the 12 disciples, arguing among, you know, among themselves, who's better? Who's the greatest? Who's number two? Who's Jesus' number two? And therefore, number one among the 12, right? Now, from the book of John, we know that the, the disciples were even jostling for, you know, to be that number two. That's how we know specifically. The disciples were convinced that they were marching towards greatness as they were getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, Greatness fully, completely in the worldly sense of the word. They got excited with every miracle and every success, which is why Jesus had to temper, you know, kind of calm them down, temper their enthusiasm every time. Verse 10, when the disciple apostles returned after, you know, they scattered and they did amazing things, they told Jesus everything they had done. Then Jesus slipped quietly away with them towards the town of Bethsaida. He withdrew them himself included, from the crowds. And then verses 21 to 27, after Peter's reply to Jesus that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus affirms his answer, but then he clarifies with some heavy statements of what it really means to be the Messiah. And then we have today's passage. As the disciples are arguing over who's top dog, you know, among them after Jesus, you know, kind of like spiritual children, right? Jesus refers to a child to teach them that whoever is the least among you will actually be the greatest. Now, Jesus, you know, refers to a child and says, you know, whoever welcomes a child like this on my behalf. In Matthew, Jesus says, to enter the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, you must turn from your sin, NLT version, and re, uh, become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. So being as humble as a child, it means to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But ask any parent, myself included, I have three children, um, that children, young children, are far from sinless and they are far from being humble. So what does this mean? In ancient culture and societies, children were not thought of very highly or even very valuably or importantly at all. Um, you know, the child was not valuable or worthy until they could actually work to produce. So the child is an example of the quote-unquote little and insignificant ones whomever followers of Jesus are to receive, right? The people that are looked down on, the people that no one cares about, the people that everyone thinks are unimportant. People who would receive them, embrace them even, are the greatest in the kingdom of, he of heaven. Here, embracing means to accept and even to love. In today's modern society, we live in very exclusive bubbles, social bubbles. 
school, church, work, maybe sports and a few other things, right? Now, the church actually might be the most diverse of our social bubbles, and I hope it is. We must practice loving people outside our bubbles, especially the people that we don't even look at, that we don't even regard. And in doing so, we learn humility. We learn love as we embrace. And that is what we need to grow in and what Jesus is talking about. You know, I truly believe that nothing teaches humility like service. And the church has many ministries. And you know, have you ever wondered about why the church worship is called a service? Right? It's a place and it's a time where people come to serve and to be served. Even as Christ came to serve, right? His death on the cross was a form of service for us, to save us, to redeem us out of sin and darkness. And that is what the church is called to do. And that is why we serve. A default posture of a Christian is to be in service at all times. And that teaches us humility. The church has many ministries that are there not for you to work, to get something out of you, but to give you opportunities to learn humility and to learn love, to practice humility and to practice love. So if you are not serving, you should be serving. That is what Christ came to do. How are we not serving when Jesus, our Lord and Savior, came to serve? And then for all of us, the, the ministries that we have that we may have been overlooking some is just involves manual labor. And those things helps us to go out of our social bubbles, to meet with people, serve people, embrace people that we would never meet, that we would never care about or even approach otherwise. So use the church, make those, you know, use those things available, the ministries for you to grow in love and humility. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word uh, that reminds us, O oh Lord, what it means to be a disciple. God, uh, just as we heard and talked about, help us to grow in our humility and love, Lord. Open our eyes uh, to see the people that we have just been skipping and skimming over, that we have been blind to. And Lord, move our hearts, God, your spirit, move us to serve and to also be served by others. May we truly embrace the church, the body of Christ, to serve the body, but also outside the body, to more, even more and truly grow in love and humility. We thank you. May your spirit speak to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.